Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for bringing us here together as a family of believers in Christ, a family of believers in the scripture. Father, we thank you for sustaining us throughout the week and keeping us healthy and whole and safe. Father, today I ask a special blessing upon everybody that's here in this room together. Bless their lives, bless their uh, children, their families, their spouses, the people they love, their homes, and their businesses. And Father, we just ask that you be with us now as we open your word. Speak to our hearts. Help us to receive your word and have ears to listen. And also, Father, the most important part, help us to put what we learn today into practice. May Jesus be in the midst of all of us today as I pray and give thanks in your holy name. Amen and amen. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Jesus says, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. I... I often wonder about that verse because Jesus doesn't say, you know, I come in like the CIA and the FBI and I force my way in. And I just say, I'm here, you know. No, what Jesus does, he stands at the door patiently and he knocks at the hearts of people until they allow him to come in. And once he is asked to come in, then he's going to have something very intimate with you. It says that he's going to have dinner time with you. Amen. There's nothing better than to have a, a quaint, nice dinner with somebody and just, you know, the, the restaurant can be very busy and loud, but when you're having a quaint dinner with somebody, it's intimate. You're looking into each other's eyes, you're listening to each other's words, um, you're reminiscing about stuff. I went to California a few years ago and I stopped at a, a, a local restaurant. It was a diner, um, very famous diner, been there for about 60 years now, it's called uh, James, and every local person goes there. So I actually kind of went there to see, well, maybe I'll see somebody that I know. And um, as soon as I ordered, a young man comes walking in I hadn't seen in 25 years, my youngest co cousin, Mando. And uh, we both have changed a little bit, you know. They used to call me skinny and ugly, now they just call me ugly. And um, Mando too, he's changed a little bit. Um, but as soon as we saw each other, immediately we got up and walked towards each other and embraced. And uh, for the next seven and a half hours, <laughs> we stayed in that diner. It, we started at breakfast. It went to lunch and dinner. We even saw a shift change of waitresses come in. Um, but it was such a wonderful experience because we had time to dine together, uh, to talk about, so, just to catch up on so many things. Um, that we had uh, missed over the past 25 years. But a dinner can be intimate. I was so happy that I was able to see him and we got to share so many things. And you know, that's what Jesus wants to do with you. He wants to have an opportunity to communicate with you and share the joys of the hope that we have with him. And you know, Revelation has a lot of neat things about it, but what I want to talk to you today is found in the book of Revelation chapter 21. You know, um, chapter 21 gives us an insight to what God is preparing for us right now. We've been talking a little bit um, about the seven churches in Revelation. Now we're going to go a little bit and move forward. You know, the, the, the work of the church is to do what mainly? To share the gospel, the Great Commission, to go into all nations, all kindreds, tongues, and languages, and share the gospel message that we have of hope, of redemption, of forgiveness, of mercy and grace and most of all, salvation. Amen? See, we have a work to do, folks. And we have to have that vision of heaven so that when we talk to people about it, it's going to be exciting. If you're going to Hawaii, if you're going on a trip, on a cruise, if you're going somewhere to Europe, maybe some special place, you usually tell people with excitement, guess where I'm going, right? And, and then you post everything on Facebook and everybody gets mad because they're not there with you. <laughs> Enjoying the beauties that you put, the pictures that you put on Facebook. We have a place where we're going to. In fact, Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself so that where I am, there you may be also. Amen. You see, God's excited about what's he doing for us. He's going to prepare a place for us, a place called home, a place called heaven, the new Jerusalem. And you know what, folks? I'm looking forward to that because I'm tired of this place already, aren't you? The other day I woke up to news that 49 people 
lives were taken because of a deranged person in New Zealand, and it just breaks my heart to have to hear that over and over. It's like, okay, when is the next terrible thing going to happen? There still is misery and pain and suffering going on in the world today. In our own backyards, down the street, there is pain and misery going on today. There are people uh, who are homeless. Yesterday, I uh, went out to eat with um, my wife and we talked to the waitress there, and she says, you know, there's more homeless people growing in a popka? And I says, yes, I've been noticing that. It's been more visible. Not only homeless people, but homeless people who have some mental disabilities as well. And so I, I get to a point sometimes when I, when I hear the news, or when I read uh, items, it just breaks my heart. I was reading a, an article the other day of a woman who had to tell her eight-year-old boy that he was going to die. Such a heart-wrenching story this mother wrote. Uh, because everything the doctors told her, this new treatment, that this new regiment that they had, this new way of uh, uh, attacking the cancer, leukemia this little boy had, was to bring them hope and hopefully a cure. And this is what the doctors were telling her. So she was telling her little boy the same thing. Son, you're going to be fine. It's all going to go away. But the cancer kept increasing. The pain kept increasing. And suddenly the doctors told her, your son has but a few hours to live. And now she had to go and talk to her son and say, son, you are going to die. I never want to be in that situation. And I hope those of you in this congregation also never have to be put in that situation. I remember one time my little boy, Richie, he's 30 years old now, but when he was a little boy, he had a lump in one of his glands here in his neck. And the doctor right away said, well, it's Hodgkin's disease or some type of leukemia. Why don't you go take some tests? And when my wife took me to the doctor's office full of young kids that had cancer and bald heads, my son looked at my wife and said, Mommy, am I going to die? That was one of the most darkest days that my wife had with our son. Thank the Lord, it just happened to be an, uh, an overgrown lymph node, which they eventually took out years later. He's strong as a champ. But it's, it's heart-wrenching to see parents have to go through these difficult times and watch their children deteriorate right before their eyes. She said she didn't want it to be a terrible time to watch her child die, so she called her friends and relatives and family members. Even kids from the school came, and they started having parties for him because he didn't die within two hours or three hours. He lasted another week. But one of the things she said was three things to a, di a dying person. What do you say to a dying person, by the way? We have a message of hope. Amen? She says, number one, tell them that they're not going to be alone when they die, that you're going to be there, right there with them. I work in a nursing home as a chaplain, and one of the nurses called me and says, Chaplain, can you come in? I said, sure, what's going on? She says, can you stay with Mrs. So-and-so? She's in the process of dying, and I can't stay with her anymore. I have to go to take care of some chores that I have, and, but I don't want her to die alone. And one of the benefits of being a chaplain is I have time. And so I was able to be by her bedside, hold her hand, and say a prayer with her for the next hour and a half until she took her last breath. And you know, it's an awesome experience when you get to be with somebody who takes her last breath because it's a, it's a cleansing breath. It's a... <sighs> breath of life that comes from above. When God formed man out of the dust of the ground, he breathed into the nostrils of Adam the breath of life, and man became a living being, a living soul, a living person. The Bible tells us that God's breath keeps us alive. Without his breath, we have no life. But Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And he that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he, what folks, live. I love when Jesus gives us that opportunity of hope. Many times we think that death is final. Many times we believe that death is the end of the road. I was with some people whose son had died, and the wailing that came from within, 
it was, it was something that I had never experienced before. And it was a, a wailing of despair, a wailing of separation forever. And, and, I, and I walked over to her, and, and there was no consoling this mother, which I understand, but at the same time, to the Christian who believes, we have hope. It's not merely so long forever, it's just, I'll see you on the other side, right? I'll, I'll see you when I see you again. The mother with the little boy who was dying after he died, she, well, before she, he died, she says, you won't be alone. You will not be in any more pain. And we are going to be okay. The promise is that when we get to heaven, folks, we won't ever have to deal with pain or suffering or illness again. No more worrying about poking your finger to check your diabetic numbers or your sugar levels. Amen? No more going to dialysis. Amen? No more going to the doctors and getting exams and waiting for the results and being afraid and full of anxiety and hoping that you, know, you don't have diabetes or you don't have a kidney disease or something's failing you or some type of cancer. When my father called me up one time to tell me he had uh, prostate cancer, he, he, even though English was his second language, but he was born in the States, he couldn't say prostate well. And he says, mijo, tengo prostate cancer. Dad, what's prostate? You know, tu sabes, you know, prostate. It sounded more like he was trying to tell me like uh, some type of uh, toothbrush uh, whitening. But, you know, cancer spreads so much when you don't get it at an early stage. And it was already all over his body. But, you know, when we were there with him, one of the things I was able to say is, Dad, I'm here. Because he lives in, or he lived in California, and I was here in Florida. And it was interesting because as soon as I walked into the room, his face lit up. I says, Dad, I'm here with you. And I even had to tell my dad, it's okay to die. Because he was worried about my little brother. He kept saying, are you going to take care of Billy? I says, Dad, don't worry about a thing. He's going to be all right. And sometimes you have to tell people that as well. I was with a young woman who had breast cancer and part of the family, and I said, Mijita, are, are you afraid of dying? And she says, yes. And I told her, death is merely sleeping. You close your eyes, you go to sleep, and when you wake up, because she believes in Jesus, you're going to hear a wonderful voice that sounds like smooth waters going over rocks like a stream. You're going to hear a shout of the archangel, you're going to hear the trumpet call of God and the angels will come down and lift you up out of your grave and you'll see the face of Jesus. What a beautiful experience. It's not a dream. It's going to be a reality. Why? Because the scripture tells me so and I believe it. How about you? But I want to talk about the place that we're going to, folks. Revelation chapter 21. The Apostle John, the disciple, the one who was the revelator, the one who was given the special visions that Jesus said, you must write these things down, tell the people about them, of the things which must shortly come to pass, so that they will prepare, so that they will believe, so that they will share the message of hope that we have. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Amen? Next week I'll be going up to Tennessee, one of the most beautiful places in the United States, right? There's mountains there. <laughs> And I love mountains, being from California. But these mountains have beauty in them, especially up in the Smoky Mountains. Uh, there's streams and rivers and lakes. There's wildlife. There's just a beauty about being in the mountains. And I'm looking forward to that. When I get to heaven, I'm trying to imagine what it's going to be like. The Bible says that eye hath not seen, ear has not heard, neither has entered into the hearts of men the things that God is preparing for those that love Him. And I ask you the question, do you love Him? And if you do, guess what? He's preparing a place for you specifically. Amen? I know that in my, my house in heaven, there's going to be a lot of fruit trees, folks, and you guys can come and sit with me a while and, and eat fruit, all the fruit that you want. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, 
And there was no more C. What does that mean, no more C? Well, you know, C is the, divi the divider, right? Uh, we have family on the other side of the ocean, people will say. But what keeps us from visiting them is getting over there. You know, how long did it take for the pilgrims to get across the Atlantic Ocean on a boat? A month or two? Um, today we have planes that fly. They don't fly directly across the ocean for safety precautions. But they hug into the coast and they come around and they land in Europe. It's a nine-hour flight. Years ago, you were able to take a jet called the Concord and pay some heavy-duty money, but you, know, you would fly there and get to Europe in an hour. Amazing technology. Where we've come to. We think about this new heaven and new earth, we won't have to worry about means of transportation because hopefully God has set up something else better for us. Amen? Um, maybe we'll be able to move in a flash of lightning. I'm not sure what that mode of transportation is going to be, but getting from A to B isn't going to be a problem. So there won't be any expanse that will separate us ever again. Amen? My mother lives in California. When she calls me up and says, Mijito, I don't feel good, I'm sick. It kills me because I'm 3,000 miles away. I can't just go to her house and see how she's doing. So if you've got a mom that lives nearby, go visit her today. Amen? Go visit her today. Because it kills me because I can't visit my mom. I can't just get on a plane and go. I'm, I'm rich, but I'm not rich. You know what I'm talking about? I'm only rich by name. So there will be no more separation, amen? In heaven we'll be together and we'll be able to have immediate access to everybody, amen? I'm getting excited about it already, how about you? Because, <laughs> you know, when I want to visit somebody and I says, oh my gosh, I, I don't have the money to afford a plane ticket to get there, there's not going to be that obstacle anymore, praise God. And so he says, I saw a holy city, the new Jerusalem, the place of Hope and peace, Salem, peace. That's what I'm looking for, aren't you? Guess what, guys? We're not going to need these in heaven. Amen? We're not going to need wheelchairs in heaven. We're not going to need any assistance in anything, no hearing aids. Amen? We're going to have our own teeth in heaven. Give me a break. Never have cavities ever again. We won't need the EPA or... Uh, dental association or any of that stuff anymore. You know why? Because there's not going to be anything harmful for us. Amen? There's going to be a new place. No contamination whatsoever. You know, when I grew up in Los Angeles, we used to live about 20 miles north of L.A., up in the hills, and you could see, when I was a kid, the brown layer of smog that covered the tops of the city. And that was the air that we breathed when we were kids. We'd be running outside, and all of a sudden, you could feel the pain of your chest and <gasps> trying to breathe. <gasps> and the pain of the chest almost felt like a heart attack. And they would call us in and say, guess what, kids? There's no playtime today. You're going to have to stay inside because there's a smog alert. And that was back in the 70s. Now, they've come a long way, and they've cleaned up a lot of the smog, but it's still there. You can still see. And in fact, it's moved in even closer to the valley in which we lived and beyond the valley over the mountains into another valley. When, when I was living there, there was only about 5 million people living there. Now there's close to, I believe they said, 11 million people living in the city of Los Angeles. And everybody has a car. But, you know, when you would see that brown layer of smog, and you would think, is that what I'm breathing? Is that what's actually going through my veins and into my lungs, through my nostrils? We have smog here in Florida. We just live in a peninsula, so we're very lucky because of the crosswinds and the rain that comes and washes it out. Today, we just have to deal with the pollen. But I'm looking forward for no more pollution, amen? There's not going to be a Flint, Michigan with poisonous lead in the water, tearing apart the lives of young people. We won't have to worry about contaminants going into the waters from the different types of corporate people that contaminate our waters. We won't have to worry about those things anymore. We won't have to worry about people telling us that this is good and in actuality it's not. 
I'm looking forward to the river that flows from the throne of God. Amen. In fact, it says that. It says, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. One of the best things about heaven, the promise of heaven, is God himself will be with us. Amen? And we'll be able to see him face to face and talk to him directly. There'll be no more need for a mediator to go before us in God. No more need for a high priest. No more need for somebody to go before us an advocate because you know why? We will be holy beings. No man can see God today and live, the Bible says, because we are but filthy rags. We are full of sin. Even Moses asked to see the face of God. And God says, I can't allow you to see my face because you will not be able to see me and live. But I'll tell you one thing. I'll put you in between this crevice of the mountain that can hold you as I walk past you and I'll expose the backside of me unto you just for a few seconds. And the whole earth shook when God walked. And Moses trembled and saw the glory of the Lord. And if it wasn't but for the grace of God, he would have perished. We'll be able to see him face to face. What a wonderful promise, amen? No more obstacles. You know, today, uh, somebody mentioned to me they, they wanted to talk to a congressman or the mayor or the governor of the state. I says, well, that's going to be a difficult task. Can we just call on the phone and say, yeah, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to come by and see you today? That's not going to happen. You, first of all, you've got to get through their secretaries, Right? And then you get put on a list and maybe they'll call you back. I called, well, I emailed the leader of the corporate office in my particular job, who's in charge of what I do. It's been three weeks and I have yet to hear from him. Interesting, huh? Imagine if you called or you wanted to meet the President of the United States. Good luck. But we have a direct line to Jesus, folks. It's called 1-800-PRAYER. There's a lot of people on that line at all times, but it can be a party line. But when you get on it, it's a private line, and it's a direct line to him. Amen? Don't ever forget that. He's the creator of the heaven and, and the universe and the earth and everything in it. But we can come to him and call at him at any time, and he will answer. He's not going to put you on hold. He's not going to say, let me look at my calendar. He's going to respond to you immediately. may not like the way he responds, though, but he's going to... He's going to respond to you. Amen? He himself will live with us. Amen? He's not going to live far away. He's going to be right there. He's going to, we're going to have access to the Heavenly Father. One thing he says in verse 4, He shall wipe away all tears from our eyes, and there shall be no more death. Somebody say praise the Lord. No more death. Death that separates us from the people that we love. Death that's come so early. Death that can come at a time when we least expect it. I got to work on Wednesday and I opened up my computer and what I do is I look at the census to see how many people have come into the nursing home and I also see who has been sent home, who's discharged from the facility. But there's one thing I hate to see and that is those who have been discharged by death. And I came in on Wednesday morning only to see that there was four people that had passed overnight. Four of them that I see every day, that I interact with every day, that I talk with every day. Now they're gone out of my life. And it just, it kills me inside to know that you never know when death calls your name. Sometimes we may see a person transitioning and declining and you have an expectation but when it comes all of a sudden, that's when it really hurts, right? My grandmother, who was like my second mom, died in 1981 of heart failure. And this is going to sound weird, folks, but I suffered her heart attack. I was 18 years old, and I went to bed that night on May 4th. And I experienced so much pain in my chest I fell to the ground out of my bed and was crawling to my mother's room to tell her, Mommy, what's going on? I'm experiencing this terrible pain. It's like an elephant is sitting on me. 
It was in the middle of the night. When I finally got to my mother's room and banged on the door, she came and, Mijo, what's going on? I don't know. I got this pain. It won't leave me. It's hard to breathe. And she sat with me. Like all Mexican mothers, they get their rubbing alcohol and they rub your chest and then they get the Vicks. They rub your chest. Vicks cures everything, folks. And then later on that morning, we woke up to my grandfather calling us to say that grandma had died in her sleep. You see, she was the woman that when I was sick, my father would carry me to her house and lay me in her bed and she would lie right next to me and I could feel the warmth of her body that made me instantly feel better. She was a woman that made sure always that I had food to eat, that I was loved. She made sure that I knew that I was special. I, she did that to all her grandchildren. But I was, I was loved by her. And when she left this earth and fell asleep, it pained me so much to stand at her casket and see her there. And I can no longer hear her sweet voice or see her smile anymore. I can no longer hear her call me. Mijito, ven acá. It just tore me apart. And then when I became a Christian, a Bible-believing Christian, and I found out that we have a hope, wow, it changed my whole outlook, amen? Because you know what now, George? I want to play Ring Around the Rosie in Heaven when I get to, there, to that place with my grandmother again, amen? I'm looking forward to that. So many people that I've loved that have left so early in my life, I'm looking forward to having an encounter with them as well. Jesus says that he's going to wipe away all our tears. There'll be shown. no more sorrow, no more death, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. Amen? How many of you are going through pain today? Some sort of pain? You know, it's funny. As you get older, I don't, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's our diet. Maybe lack of exercise. I don't know what it is. But I could be standing and all of a sudden something just starts to hurt. And I'm like, what's going on down there? What's, going, what's happening? Pain just falls out of the sky sometimes, it seems, right? I'm walking straight, and all of a sudden, what was that? You know? I, I've passed that mid-age, you know, I'm going to be 57 years old. Still a young kid, right, in some of you guys' eyes, right? But the other day, my little niece, who's only seven, she goes, boy, you're old and fat. You know, kids, they'll always tell you the truth, right? So I took her advice and I got on a bike and started pedaling, right? <laughs> I think I lost half of a gram. Feels pretty good. But kids will tell you exactly what you need to hear, right? And that's all right because she loves me. So I took it with a grain of salt and I said, thank you, Mejita. Keep telling me how fat I am so I can keep reminding myself that I need to do something about this. But pain, pain is something that tears us apart. Whether it's a headache or arthritis, you know, we're looking for all types of remedies for all these things, amen? And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you, uh, right now the state of Florida has just passed a law into allowing people to use medical marijuana now as treatment. And it's funny because I was talking to my mom the other day, she says, son, that's not news. We've been using marijuana for years. My, my Thea, my aunt, used to grow her own in the backyard, and she would use it for her rheumatoid arthritis, and she would mix it with this alcohol that she used to get from Mexico, and uh, she would put the dried-up marijuana in the alcohol, and then she would rub the alcohol on her rheumatoid arthritis, and it would take away the pain instantly. She'd only get mad when my cousin Chaku would find her bush and take it, you know, for other purposes. But... Um, this was nothing new. My grandmother, whose mother was an Aztec Indian, knew of many different types of herbs and various types of plants that you could use to resolve different types of uh, illnesses. In fact, she ate a leaf of a plant that kept her from having children. Interesting, huh? That's what they knew. And I was like, I would tell my dad, Dad, why didn't you write all this stuff down? You know, or before Grandma died, talk to her about all these things. See, the indigenous folks knew a lot. And especially, you know, today, 
we have a thing called peppermint or spearmint. So whenever you have a, a, a stomach pain or some type of a, a stomach ache, just make yourself a little bit of tea with spearmint or peppermint. Add some honey and lemon in it. You'll be good as new. Um, but, you know, there was those types of things that we're able to treat our, whatever ails us. The scripture says this. In heaven, there's going to be something very special there. Let me go to chapter 22, verse 1. John writes, And he showed me a pure river of life, the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and out of the Lamb. The Lamb is the one who gave us salvation from our sins. He is Jesus Christ. And in the midst of the street of it, on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, yet yield her every month. Every month there's going to be a new type of fruit growing on that tree. I'm looking forward to that, because I love all types of fruit. But listen to this. And the leaves of the tree were there for the healing of the nations. Amen? The healing of the nations. If you have kidney problems, you can go to the loquat tree. You know what loquat trees? There's all kinds all over Florida. You get those trees, you boil them up, and you drink it as a tea. Why? Because those leaves have healing properties in it. You know what? I think when we get to heaven, God's going to say, the cure for cancer was right there in front of you all the time. But you used to spray Roundup on it all the time. <laughs> There's going to be some type of weed that was everywhere, right? I mean, one time I was in the backyard plucking weeds, and my grandmother comes out, ¿Qué estás haciendo? What are you doing? And I got started, and Grandma, I'm cleaning up, picking weeds. Those aren't weeds. That's food. She said, Eso son verdolagas. These, this is a, a, a plant that in the Depression, this is what we ate. That's all we had. It's amazing what we see as weeds and what people saw as food. I was walking in the desert one time with my grandfather, and I was saying, man, how desolate. He goes, what are you talking about? He walked over. He got a piece of cactus. He took out his knife, and he, he cleaned all the thorns off of it. Then he opened it up. He says, eat. I says, what? He says, eat. I says, grandpa, aren't you supposed to cook it? He says, yeah, you can, but... This is all the nutrients is going to be good for you, mijo. All the water that comes out of it as well. Then he grabbed from the prickly pear the fruit of the cactus. And he peeled and he says, eat. Tasted like candy. What we see as desolate and desert was actually food. And then he took the long, very strong needles off of the agave plant. And I says, what are you doing with that? And he took the long fibers of the agave plant off. And he says, this is what we use to sow. And this is the thread, <laughs> the fibers. Interesting. Interesting. And then it was, as we continued to walk, we saw this cactus that was standing up upright, and it was shaking. And my grandfather says, be careful of that. And I says, why? Well, why is it shaking? Is, there's no wind. What's going on? He says, there's tarantulas in there. <laughs> And I said, tarantulas, ooh, let's look. You know, a little kid wants to see. So he picked up a stick, and he hit it. And he kept hitting it till it kind of broke open. And it was like out of the, uh, what was that zone TV show was called? The Twilight Zone. It was like a movie like the Twilight Zone. All these tarantulas came out of the cactus plant and just started crawling. Of course, you know, I was running as fast as I could. You know, folks, God is preparing for us a place where we can't even start to imagine or think the beauties, the wonders, the splendors of heaven. In this earth, we have some crazy stuff going on, but you know, God is going to provide for our every need. Amen? We will plant in heaven. The Bible says that we're going to plant our own vineyards. So there still will be a little bit of work to do, but it's going to be wonderful work. You know, I had a, a Thea, a, an aunt, when she used to clean, she used to sing songs. I am sweeping away my sins through the power of the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? She didn't see work as a chore or as a duty. She saw it as pleasure, you know? And then she'd get to the dishes and see, we still have Mexican dishwashers in our house. It's nothing electric. It's me or my wife. 
and washing the dishes. We're cleaning away our lives to make them sparkle again. From It's how you look at things, amen? It's how we look at things. And so, knowing that God's going to wipe away all of our tears, there won't be any more death. And then he says we're going to have clear crystal water coming out of the throne of God. And we're going to have a tree of life that gives a fruit, a new fruit every month. I'm looking forward to that. In the midst of the street on either side was that tree of life. I'm looking to have that access. How about you? But here in verse 4, once again it says, there shall be, well verse 3 says, there shall be no more curse but the throne of God and out of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. It'll be our honor to now serve the one who once came to serve us. For Jesus Christ says, I came not to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. That's why His title, the Lamb, who takes away the sin of the world, is appropriate in this place. And now we get to serve Him out of love. But you know what, folks? We can do that today. Amen? The Bible says, if you love me, obey and keep my commandments. And as Jesus told Satan, thou shalt love the Lord thy God and serve him only. Worship him only. We can do that now, can't we? We can serve him now, can't we? We can show the love of God in our hearts and mind to a hurting world. We can take away pain from people if we just go and we sit and listen and hold their hand while they die, knowing that they're not alone knowing that somebody cares enough to spend their last breathing moments with them. It's kind of weird as I was up all night with my father the day before he passed, and, and I told my son, I said, Julian, I need to sleep. I can't keep my eyes open. Give me about 20 minutes, but if anything happens, come and get me. I went into this stupor of sleep immediately. I think I fell asleep even before my head hit the pillow. And I went into this crazy dream where I went up this, this roller coaster, really slow, up high. And I was sitting in the front row, which I would never have done. I don't even go on roller coasters anymore, by the way. But as I got to the top, I realized there was no more track. But yet, the roller coaster kept going, and I started going down. And I remember hearing the horrific screams. And then I felt my son, wake up, dad, wake up, dad, wake up. Something's happening to Aha. That's what he used to call my father, Aha. It's because my dad used to play with him and say, Aha. <laughs> so they ended up calling him Aha. And I kind of heard what was going on, but I was, I was afraid because I was going down this roller coaster and there was no more track. And my son wakes me up, dad, come. And I jumped up and was trying to find my way and walked into the next room and caught my father take his last breath. <sighs> what an awesome experience. He who gave me life, I was privileged to see him take his last breath. Life is precious, isn't it? And you are precious too. You are precious in the sight of the Lord. And you are loved with an everlasting love. And that's why he's promised us the new home with no more pain, with no more suffering, and no more death. Amen? But here's the kicker or the best part of heaven. Verse 4 of chapter 22. And they shall see his face. Amen? Amen? How many of you want to see the face of God? without any barriers? How many of you want to hear his voice? How many of you want to be able to touch him? I do. And it says in their name, and his name, excuse me, shall be in their foreheads. What does that mean? It just is a symbolic way of saying that we have given our hearts and minds and our, everything we are to our one God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And you know, when Jesus told his disciples, because they said, show us the Father and we'll be happy. And he says, haven't I been with you guys for three and a half years? Haven't I walked with you? Haven't I ate with you? Haven't you seen me do the things that honor the Father? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Well, none of you guys have met my dad, but you've seen Raymond Jimenez Guerrero today. 
because I wanted to be everything like my father. I wanted to walk like him and talk like him and stand like him and move like him, even smoke cigarettes like him. If you've seen me, you know my dad. We're going to see God face to face, folks. And I'm looking forward to that. How about you? No more will we be afraid because of our sinfulness to come before a holy God. We'll have direct access to him. So you know, I'll be honest with you. I don't really want to die. and I'm not sure how I'm going to die. I, I don't want to die in a tragic death. I was riding my motorcycle yesterday and as I'm riding it, I'm continuously praying because <laughs> we live in Florida and it just came out in the newspaper the other day on Friday that Florida is one of the worst places in the nation to be driving. And there's a combination of reasons why. Part of it is all the construction. Part of it is because we have people coming in from all over the world that have different types of ideas on how to drive. Some of it has to be because of our young people who aren't trained properly in order to drive. They think because the speedometer says you can go 110 miles an hour, they think they can on I-4. Some of it has to be with also our senior population who maybe can't see as well anymore. Um, and some people are just impatient and don't really care about anybody but themselves. And so when I ride, I'm like, Lord, thank you for bringing me thus far. Thank you for keeping me safe with your angels. Now I'm heading back home, Father. Continue to be with me. But if I should not make it home, Lord, just make it quick. <laughs> because, uh, you know, I've been in many accidents as a kid on my bike, uh, bicycle, jumping jumps and flying through the air like Evil Knievel, thinking I was Evil Knievel. And I was so happy that I didn't feel the pain when my brother said my head was sliding across the dirt with all the rocks and the broken glass. I just woke up out of the concussion a couple hours later and said, what happened? That's what I wanted to be when I see Jesus. What happened? Oh, Lord, I'm so happy to see you. Was it painful? We shouldn't be afraid of death, folks. I have this saying now. I guess it's because I got this gray hair now. I kind of chopped it off to kind of make sure, you know, that it didn't overtake my whole head. But I have this saying now. It's a good day to die. That's my attitude now. Do you know why? Because I want to see his face. It may sound kind of selfish, but I'm tired of the pain and suffering of this world. I'm tired of hearing that there was another a terrible, senseless killing of 49 people, not only here in Orlando, but now in New Zealand. I'm tired of the suffering and pain of others in different countries because people are killing them because of their religion or their faith or the color of their skin. I'm tired of all the terrible things that are happening, not just in other nations, but in this nation as well. I'm ready to go home. Jesus can't come soon enough for me. But before he comes... Not only do I want to be ready, but I want to prepare those to meet him as well, even my enemies, amen? I want them to know Christ. I want them to know the splendors of heaven. We have a message to tell today, folks. Jesus is coming, but he wants you to be ready. So get prepared. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is yet near. They shall see his face. And he will be our light forever and ever. And then he says, say these things to the faithful and to the faithful, because these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophet sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which shortly must be done. And verse 7 in chapter 22 says, Behold, Jesus is speaking, I come quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Remember the, the word blessed means to be happy? And folks, we have a happy, happy message. What a beautiful day it will be when my Jesus I shall see, when, I, when he takes me by the hand and he leads me to the promised land. What a glorious day that will be. I think that's what they got your name from, Glory about glorious. Start telling people about how glorious the 
day is going to be when we meet our Savior, Jesus Christ. Folks, time is short, but we can do it, amen? One of the biggest organizers that ever led people who didn't have money and didn't have means, he says, I don't need everybody, all I need is 10%, I can change. I can change the lives of many, and he was able to accomplish that in California. And you know what, we just stay focused on the small things we don't have to reach a million people. All we have to do is reach 10. And guess what? Those 10 will reach 20. And those 20 will reach 50. And those 50 will reach 100. And before you know it, the message continues to grow. Why? Because you can't stop the Holy Spirit from moving hearts. Amen? My prayer is that we will start to study God's Word more. And whatever we learn, as directed by the Holy Spirit, we will tell somebody about it. So my challenge to you this week is that you take the message that we have received and share it with one other person. Amen? Might be your neighbor. Might be your coworker. Might be your spouse. Might be your child. Might be the neighbor who's a little bit of a pain in the butt. All of us have those, right? That's what they call us too, by the way. Everybody is a candidate for the kingdom, amen? May God use you. May God inspire you. May God guide and direct your ways is my prayer. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this privilege we have today to come together and listen to your word, to be filled with the Holy Spirit through music and through prayer, through fellowship and through message. Today, Father, speak to our hearts like never before and prepare us to share this gospel message with others. Help us, Lord, to find ways to be creative and not just to bring people to church, Father, but to share with them the joys that we have of knowing that you've gone to prepare a place for us, a place where there's no more pain or suffering or death, a place where we'll be able to fellowship together and see you face to face. What a glorious, wonderful time that will be. But that time will be eternal, and I want you there. So prepare us, Father, to receive you when you come. As we pray, as we pray, Father, and rely on you to get us there. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful Sabbath.